So I'm coming from a place assuming that you don't know much about the career program. Some of you may know some things already, but, but let's just try to cover as much as we can. So careers intent is to support early career faculty who have the potential to serve as academic role models in research and education and to lead advances in the mission of their department or university. So that doesn't, doesn't seem in the past that I've heard that mission stated quite the same. Uh, maybe it has and I've missed it, but um, really uh, as far as how, how you play the part you play in an institution, I think that's interesting and, and something you need to be cognizant of as you're writing your proposal. Um, career is foundation wide. So all directorates participate in the career program. You could be in social, you could be in engineering, physics, math, all of the directorates um, do have career. Um, it is based on a development plan as opposed to just a research plan. A development plan is a well-argued and specific proposal for activities, which in this is over a five-year period that builds a foundation for a lifetime of contributions to research and education. And you're gonna hear research and education together a lot this afternoon because that's one thing that sets the career proposal as, as something different than a regular proposal into NSF. Again, to build a firm foundation for integrating education and research, they're really gonna be looking for this. And the duration is five years. So that is another consideration. Are you eligible? My guess is if you're on this, uh, this call today, you probably are, but we're just going to look at this quickly. You have to have a doctoral degree in a field supported by the National Science Foundation. You have to be engaged in an, an area supported by the NSF. You need to be a tenure track assistant professor. There are some other areas that qualify, but for purposes at FSU, if you are an assistant professor and you are tenure, tenure track, you are good to go. You have to be untenured at the time of submission. It used to be that you had to be untenured by a, a date, a later date like September, and that's changed. So as long as you are untenured by the time in July when this is due, you are good. And of course, you can't already have a career award. The budget limits for the proposal, well, first of all, the proposal itself, you can only submit one annually and no more than three total. So you get three shots at this. Many people use all three shots. So um, you may not get it your first time. You may not get it your second time. Some people get it the first time, second time. It really has varied from our awardees. Um, keep in mind that you, you cannot be tenured and you get three shots. So you've got a window there that you can apply. That's important to think about because you don't wanna to wait too far along where you can't apply a third time if you need to. So always keep that in mind when you're deciding if this is time for you to submit or not. Um, the budget limits for the career program are minimums. So it is a minimum of $400,000 for five years, including indirect costs, unless you're in the biological sciences or engineering directorates. And those are $500,000 minimums. So there's no maximum award size, but here's what you need to do to figure out where you are. Talk to a program officer, and before you do that, I would recommend you go to the awards database at NSF, bring up the career awards and look at how much they have been funding in your area, in your directorate. That'll give you a ballpark of what you can ask. Um, that's just a smart way to handle it, this two-pronged approach so that you're in an area they feel that they can handle. There has been times when um, Faculty members have been asked to revise their budgets, um, so that can happen, but um, it's, it's good to get as close to what they would accept as you can. So the deadline for this year is July 26th. Um, 
the internal deadline will be July 21st. That's a Wednesday and it'll be 9 a.m. on the 21st in the sponsored research. Um, that seems like a long time away, but it's not as long as you think. I mean, we're already into March, right? So I would recommend you start planning now and setting some timelines. Uh, we have some timelines on our website to keep keep you going along so you, it doesn't creep up on you. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, a peer review uh, later on as we're talking about this that ORD offers. That also will affect your timeline if you decide to take advantage of that program. So let's just do a uh, look at the proposal itself. Um, a lot of it is, is similar to a regular NSF proposal, but some things are different. I'm going to try to focus mostly on what's different, but in some cases we'll kind of hit um, items that are relative to both. Let's just start with the cover sheet and the things you see in a kind of burgundy color are the ones I'm going to focus on. Um, one thing about career is your project name must begin with career, <clears throat> career colon and the name of your project. If you don't have the career colon in front of it, it can get thrown out. So it sounds like a little thing, but it is very important. Um, the project description section should contain a well, uh, well argued and a specific um, activity that'll cover a five year period and build that firm foundation for a lifetime of contributions to research. Um, again, it's, it's that foundation. Um, if you submit it and it's just talking about a project that is not going to fly for research for a career uh, proposal. So keep that in mind. Um, the project description, 15 pages, just like it always is. Um, the bi biographical sketch, remember there are no co-PIs in a career submission. Um, current and pending support, bio sketch and letters of collaboration. Um, those are things that you have to follow very specific formats of um, and NSF provides you with those, that information. Um, proposals that are non-compliant with the career solicitation will be returned without review. Here are the two things that will return it without review. You've got a co-PI on it or you're missing the departmental letter. So very important for career. So the project summary, um, you know, is that one page. It's, it's got three sections, the overview, the intellectual merit, and the broader impacts. Um, I think most of you probably understand what those mean. Um, this in itself is that self-contained overview of the entire project. Um, it's your first impression, so it's most important that it flows well, it makes sense, um, this is the document that'll be read by the public. So you gotta be, you need to be careful not to have jargon. Um, you need to focus on the significance of the work. Some people like writing it first and then putting together a proposal and using it sort of as an outline. A lot of people like to write the proposal first and then put the project summary together because it, it, things can change as you write it, as you write the proposal. Um, that's up to you. Um, either way, I would say give it a few looks and let a few other people look at it as well and see that it makes sense. People who have applied to, to NSF, people who have applied to career, our office, um, get, get as many eyes on, on your work as you can. The project description, as I mentioned, that's the 15 page document. Um, successful applicants will propose creative, effective research and education plans with strategies for assessing. Um, the activities should help applicants develop in their careers as both outstanding researchers and educators, because this is about your career. Um, while excellence in both education and research is expected in this, also keep in mind that your activity level needs to be a reasonable workload. Um, I know of people who have um, been declined and told that, that they propose too much. So keep that in mind. Um, research and educational activities 
do not need to be addressed separately. Um, they can be interspersed um, if it's appropriate. People have done it both ways. So some key questions that you would want to consider as you're looking at this, as you're writing. Make sure people understand right away in that first page what you're doing, what your long-term career goal is, how this funding is going to enable it, why the project is important, and what are the research and educational goals. That, that needs to be crystal clear um, as I talk about some of these things. These are questions, if you, if you keep a copy of these slides, go back when you're finished writing this and make sure you can quickly pull out this information. The research plan, make sure you are clear about your, your research hypothesis, specific tasks and activities. Um, how will you evaluate the success of your tasks? And what is the significance of the results? How will the work conducted here influence other work to be done in the future? Um, how is it innovative? And what is the timeline? Also, and I, I, I remember there's at least one who did a, such a good job on this that it stays with me is, how do you handle if things don't go as planned? Like you anticipate X is gonna happen. What if X doesn't happen as you're doing your research? Then how will you handle that? Is it still a good thing because it has taken something away that you won't have to look at anymore? Also, you know, if X doesn't work, can you still do the next step in what you're going to do? Something to consider. The education plan and broader impacts. Um, so we're going to have a part in this session just about um, education and, and how it integrates. So we'll go into that more. But um, just briefly, the education component of the proposal maybe in a broad range of areas um, directed to any level. You could be doing K-12, you could be working with undergraduates, graduate students, um, or the general public, and, but it should be related to the proposed research and consistent with the career goals. Um, some examples of what people have done in the past can be found on our successful proposal database. Um, we'll talk about that um, later on. And education activities may also include designing new or adapting and implementing effective educational materials. Such activities would be consistent with research and best practices in curriculum and evaluation. Proposers may build on or otherwise uh, meaningfully participate in existing SF supported activities or other educational product, uh, projects going on, on campus. So if there are, are things going on already that you can join in on, that's okay. Um, that, that is completely fine. Here's a list of some education activities um, that have been done in the past. I'm going to be quiet for just a minute and let you just take a peek at some of these. And again, um, as you look at examples of successful proposals, you can get ideas through there too of what people have done and it might give you additional ideas. So we talked a little bit about the budget. Um, as you work on your budget, uh, most of you have financial uh, management staff in your departments. I would suggest you work with them. We've already talk about, talked about the minimum award. Remember, if an activity is listed in your proposal, it needs to be either listed in your budget or explained why it's not in your budget. And then, try to ask for exactly what you need. And this is true really with any proposal, not just career, not just with NSF. Always ask for just what you need. You don't wanna to try to lowball because it looks like you don't know what you're doing. And if you try to pad it, it also, it, it looks like you don't know what you're doing. So you wanna be as accurate as you can with what you request. So just some other documents that need to be included, current and pending support must be included, and, and even this proposal needs to be included in current and pending. It would just be labeled this proposal. There's also the facility statement that needs to be included. 
department letter and letters of collaboration. Um, again, specific formats. Departmental letter is very important. It must include your eligibility. It must include a statement confirming that your goals are aligned with the departments. That kind of goes along with what uh, had been mentioned earlier. And also a description on how the goals are intertwined and how the department will ensure you receive adequate mentoring. Um, I believe we have examples of letters. Your department chair, given that he has probably done these before, already has some sort of template. But if, if you end up having anything that, that causes you to stumble, please come to, come to me and talk to me and we can get you examples if you need them. So the data management plan and postdoc mentoring plan, if, if you have postdocs, you know, those are two other documents that will need to be included. Um, resources are available in our toolkit, which I'll talk about later. And um, as I said, postdoc mentoring may or not may not be applicable, but think of all these extra documents that um, you will have to include that are in addition to your proposal. That's another reason why you wanna start earlier rather than later, pulling together the documents you need. You know, just, if you, you just give yourself, say 30 days to pull all this together, you're, you're not gonna put yourself in a, a good position. Then lastly, other required documents collaborators, other affiliations, and biosketch. Um, again, just more information you need to pull together. If you have any questions as you're going through this, just contact me. And if I don't know the answer, I will get somebody to assist you. Mm -hmm.